Hello, everybody. Hello. Mycelial magic, networked intelligence, and the moldy way to grow your NGO, or how to geist bust. I like geist. This is a recording of, uh, made by uh, Merlin Sheldrake, who mentioned his dad earlier today, of an oyster mushroom, uh, uh, the electro. Um, the electro output of an, of an oyster mushroom devouring his book uh, put through an oscillator. So this is uh, a mushroom eating. And this is him jamming with it. <laughs> is it real time? Yeah. Well, he's not doing it now. Is that the sound of the oyster in real time? It's not speaking it's the Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. By means of introducing how we can um, communicate and interact with other species. Um, uh, a zeitgeist is the spirit of an age, uh, and a geist is a spirit. And um, I don't really like the spirit of this age. It strikes me as a child who doesn't want his peas to touch his, uh, his cucumber on his plate, wants everything separate, you know. Um, it feels a bit like a Zen, uh, Zen diagram, a Venn diagram where the edges don't touch. We just heard from Julia before, and she was talking about the problems with um, the problems with the farmers not knowing if it's their land or someone else's land. You know, it's again it's a division. It's just, this is mine. This is my sphere of influence, and this is theirs. And um, I don't really have the answer to how to deal with that particular zeitgeist, that particular um, spirit of the way that things are done. But I believe that these guys do. Uh, mycelia, and, and maybe more than mycelia, the type of networked intelligence that you find in nature uh, that ups, ups our collective intelligence level. Right, they're gonna be talking a lot about that. Um, obviously, this is magic ritual. So, um, are we gonna start with a banishing, right? Uh, and I just want to talk very briefly about an egregore. An egregore is a, uh, it's a spirit of a, it could be a spirit of a school or a spirit of a, a place like, uh, like this, or it can be the spirit of a, uni uh, of a like a, a workplace or something like that. And generally these are considered quite evil in magic uh, because they start to develop their own intelligence when a collective develops their own intelligence and they can start to, um, demand sacrifices and we might find that the collective um, that we are part of asks for us to do stuff that we individually disagree with and then we come into conflict with this uh, with this egregore with this kind of um, this kind of spirit um, there are other ways of collectivizing our intelligence but um, so yeah that's an egregore and an egregore is it, 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 the, the word means watcher it comes from the book of Enoch for example uh, you find it, and uh, so so an egregore is considered the uh, kind of let's say demonic spirit of a uh, of an institution, maybe the church or something. But it's also considered something else, which is the portal which a group of people together create in order to open, in order to allow spirits to come into this world. Right. So today I'm going to encourage us to uh, give power to a different type of. Egregore, different type of spirit, and allow it to come through into God. It's already coming. We're already making connections. I came up here about six weeks ago, I think. Uh, I came to visit Steve, who I met through a podcast community, and I was just I called up uh, Eric because I was in the area, and he popped down for an hour. I shared a poem with him, and he said, "Oh, you must come down here." And by the way, have you met Nicola Peel? And I went, "No, no, I haven't." Oh, you must meet her. And then about a week later. I hadn't called her anything, but I was in a meeting with her because somebody else had put us into a connection where where we are hopefully going to be uh, yeah working the same guy who's also connected to Bangor University. So these kind of strange connections seem to happen under the surface if you're willing to let them happen. And like I say, I don't have solutions to these, but these kind of bizarre connections and also the way these guys work, you know, at the edge of the of my cilia, uh, my cilial network. Or at the edge of like um, slime molds, we're going to be talking about ant colonies, whatever it might be. They um, investigate 
autonomously into a new area, they check out the nutrients and they communicate back to back across the network about about things going on. So if we can decentralize, I can say decentralize a bit, decentralize completely uh, and start to communicate across networks, I think we may find some solutions. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention Latour as well. He talks about um, um, technologies of communication upping our collective intelligence. So he says when we've got language, we start to be able to communicate our ideas. And then when we start to write language, we start to be able to get down our ideas and store our ideas, you know, so you can communicate with generations. Then when we've got the printing press, uh, you can communicate that quicker, and all this kind of collective consciousness arises. Now we've got the internet, and we can communicate very, very quickly, and uh, you know, the most popular thing people do is porn, uh, which is feeding a whole different type of egg So I think we can do something better by connecting and communicating and sharing resources. Uh, I'm a, uh, uh, I run a reforestation organization called RAIN, so we're going to be talking about that. Um, all right, so the way to overcome an egregore, according to Tomberg, who, uh, Valentin Tomberg, who was a great Catholic mystic, is uh, to turn three times to your left and recite a psalm. So I'm just going to demonstrate. One, two, the psalm comes next. Three, this is how you cast off an egregore. So can I invite you to stand up, unless you like this old, I don't want to eat my peas and uh, <laughs> touch my... Um, so if you want to do that, so we're going to do three spins to the left, and uh, we're going to do it nice and slowly, and we're going to have a psalm from James, just a few lines from it. Okay, and let's go, people. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before fire, let the wicked perish before God. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Psalm 68, you can sit down now. Well done, everybody. That feels better, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Tomberg was pretty goddy. He was really into God. He was a real Catholic dude. Um, <laughs> so, Egregor, yeah, so let's open the portal. He, f yeah, it, it, wait, I've talked about that a bit. Um, come on, come on. Um, but, uh, that's a complicated question. It's a good question. I think Mammon, yeah, because it's an institution of money that we've created and sits above it. Moloch is. I'm not sure, but it's a very good question. Um, right, so the eulogy in magic, you tend to, when you're invoking a spirit, you will talk to you know, Hermes, you move really fast, you've got great shoes, etc. So let's talk about how amazing this spirit is. And I don't talk particularly about slime molds. I like slime molds. Um, I keep them, I cultivate them. Uh, this is a slime mold uh, covering a, uh, a log. They are single celled uh, amoeba. Um, generally, they're just kind of wandering around doing their thing, eating food and communicating like the rest of us. And um, they do something really interesting. They collectivize their intelligence uh, um, and for, uh, to, to respond to a changing environment. So for example, if their log becomes dry, uh, they don't like it dry. And so what do they do? They form these kind of mushroom-like things. They're not mushrooms, they're quite low. Um, and then and they come together and then they, they do something like sporing. They're, again, it's not spores because they're not, uh, they're not fun. But, um, and that means that the individual amoeba can get onto the air currents so they can go and find somewhere else to live, which is better. So they collectivize and they can do something which an individual can't do. Because how can a less than microscopic creature uh, find its way off its, off its substrate? It can't. How does an individual person respond to changing humidity and climate change and hydrology? You can't. But you can collectivize. And when we collectivize, all kinds of incredible things can happen. And do you think that these individual amoeba know that they're going to do that? They haven't got brains, they haven't got nerve systems, you can't even see them underneath the microscope. So I guess my point here is we can do incredible things that we can't even imagine when we come together. But coming together requires communication, networking, and sharing resources. Uh, they also solve mazes. Uh, they like to eat oats, you know, and if you put them in a, a maze like that, they'll find the most efficient route between them. Um, this is my... Uh, this is my, uh, my Amy, Amy the Amoeba. <laughs> um, 
Lovely. It's a high intelligence companion I can keep in the jar. <laughs> uh, this is um, 23 hours of slime mold mapping uh, a bunch of boats. They are in the positions of major rail terminals on the, on the Tokyo Rail Network, and they managed to outdo the Japanese in efficiency of networking. So that is the uh, Japanese version. That's the Tokyo Network, that's the slime mold network. I think that's more efficient than that. Um, resource distribution is very, very important subject when there are climate disasters and famines popping up here and there, you know, and also massive overproduction in certain areas as well, because climate change doesn't necessarily mean that no one can eat. It means that you can change your crops and do different things in different areas. I met uh, some Zimbabwean farmers who uh, they can't grow maize anymore, but they're growing uh, other stuff really, really well. So what do you do about that? Well, we need to network, we need to communicate, we need to trade resources. Slime molds are amazing at trading resources. Uh, they map space. They also map time. This is incredible. If you blast a slime mold with cold air, it doesn't like it, uh, and it retreats. You can see that there. Uh, if you blast it for five minutes, if you wait an hour, you blast it for five minutes again, uh, it retreats again, but this time it retreats further. If you wait another hour, so you're basically blasting it for five minutes on the hour every hour, it's already anticipating it by the third time. So five minutes before, it's already retreating. Yeah predicts the future. Um, a little bit like, you know, when you set your alarm clock and you wake up a couple of minutes before your alarm clock, right? I sometimes manage to do that. Slime mold are cleverer than me in that, in, from that perspective. Um, pretty good. In fact, they solve mazes better than four-year-old kids. I'm still trying to work out whether these guys are intelligent. I mean, a five-year-old kid can seem pretty intelligent to me. <laughs> uh, if you then don't blast it for uh, the next hour, you don't give it cold air, uh, it anticipates it, but it realizes it's not getting blasted. So we have anticipation, we have recall, we have responding uh, and, uh, and learning and adaptation. And then if you wait a whole bunch of hours, you start again, start torturing this poor little thing again, uh, it remembers and it, it retreats again. So it can predict the future, predict rhythms in the future. Wouldn't it be good if we could predict rhythms that we can't really individually understand and perceive, you know, especially with changing climates. We talk about climate, climate chaos. Well, it's chaotic. things are chaotic. If you look at them, you don't really understand them. Yeah. Maybe there's some rhythm there. Maybe there's some cycle there. Um, these guys farm in a certain way. If they find some bacteria that they can eat, they will eat some of it, and they'll take some of it away, and they'll cultivate it so they can eat it later. Which shows more intelligence than me when I'm presented with a packet of biscuits. <laughs> they can also learn... <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, if you, if you, like, they don't like salt as well, so if you, um, if you put them on a, on a, if you basically make a salt bridge between a slime mold and between some food, they learn to cross the salt bridge, they learn that it's a good idea to do it. So if you put a, a colony which hasn't learned that, and a colony which has learned that, uh, next to some salt, the colony which has learned that will cross the salt bridge more quickly. Then what you can do is you can dry the, these guys out, you can dry them out for six months or a year, you can reanimate them, rehydrate them, and then stick them next to some salt, and they'll remember this, this thing. And also, if you put some slime mold with another slime mold colony, they will teach their friends to cross the salt bridge. Right? These guys trade information, and they'll remember. So, just summing up, what do these guys do? Respond to threats and opportunities. Uh, redistribute resources and information. Perceive rhythms in time, and predict the future. Solve problems. Guide individuals towards collective harmony working together, right? Why do they do that for the resilience of the collective? How do they do that? By plugging into a network and becoming a super organism. Wouldn't it be good if we could do that? I get the feeling that we're already doing it. We're already starting to do it. Uh, I want to talk about um, shamanism briefly. Um, this is, oh, that was too quick. Um, there, uh, so these various tropes, these various things here you see in traditional shamanism, responding to threats and uh, opportunities. One of the important um, important functions of a shaman is to, is war divination, right? For example, a shaman generally they would go off into a hut on their own with their ayahuasca, with their mushrooms, and then they would come back with information for the for the tribe. I'll tell you about this guy in a bit. We'll get to it. Um, but yes, responding to threats and opportunity. Uh, for example, uh, when are the other guys going to attack? That's a really important question in a tribal situation. Or what disease is on the way? Or why is why are we getting a certain disease? They might go and talk to the river spirits. They might be angry about a certain thing. They might be offered a certain thing to overcome that disease. 
Um, redistribution of resources and information. Uh, traditionally, they'll go and find lost objects, for example. Um, where will you find game? Now, tribes in the Amazon, which only use ayahuasca to go and make contracts with the, uh, the let's say, the mother spirits of particular animals, and they'll say, right, uh, we want three of you, because uh, we're going to eat you, and they'll go, okay, right, we'll give us something, and we'll see you tomorrow in this particular part of the jungle. And that's the only thing they do with ayahuasca, so redistributing resources from the trees onto your plant, uh, and information about it. Um, perceiving rhythms in time and predicting the future. I met a guy, I was at Kumbh Mela once upon a time, I don't know if you know that, it's a massive festival in India. Um, this was 70 million people in 2001. My daughter was there. Um, anyway, there was a guy there who had his community, he was like a little sadhu, little naked, thin guy who drank a quart of milk every day. Um, but his community had built a seven story pyramid outside. And why did they do this? He'd come down from the mountains one day, he said, there's going to be a flood. You need to move your village from that side of the river to that side of the river. They did, and there was, and this guy became a local hero. So predicting, predicting the future, right? Divination. Well, divination is uh, often about solving problems. Um, shamans are often brought in to deal with all kinds of problems, including interpersonal problems. Guiding individuals towards collective harmony, right? There's a, there's a distinction to be made between witchcraft, brujaria, and shamanism. Um, right, Brujaria, someone will uh, uh, benefit themselves to the detriment of somebody else. That's not considered very good in, in that context. And people will, some tribes will say, those guys next door, they don't do their, they do Brujaria, they don't do shamanism, because uh, you know, they don't do dietas long enough, they don't, they don't stop having sex for long enough whilst they're doing their training, something like that. Um, why do they do this for the resilience of the collective, for the tribe, for the survival of the tribe? Right? How do they do it? By plugging into a network. Uh, and becoming, becoming one with that network. So what can we learn about these guys? From these guys. What is our tribe at this point in history? Right? We have collective problems like we've never had before. So what can we do about them? I did, didn't I? Thank you for reminding me. Uh, this is Mestre Yoneo. He is the founder of Santa Daimi, which is the lineage that I trained in. Um, it's an ayahuasca uh, lineage from, uh, from the Amazon. Um, yeah, he was a uh, very tall, two meters tall black man who moved to the uh, Amazon uh, when there was a, a rubber boom, basically, and there he encountered um, local indigenous populations, they thought about to use ayahuasca, he became a healer in the local area and developed quite a lot of fame. Um, he was surrounded by, at one point the police arrived, surrounded his, his encampment was him, big tall black guy, a bunch of black guys from another part of Brazil. This is very... A uh, very conservative part of Brazil, quite a racist part of Brazil. The indigenous, he, this was, he was born two years after slavery, so racist time in history, and also after slavery was abolished, I mean. And also he was working with a, a brew which was considered devil worship and a population which would be oppressed since first contact. Yeah? So he knew about how to engage with power, and the, the police surrounded his compound one day, and they said, stop this nonsense or we're going to shut this down. And he resisted, and said, are you going to close down? He said, no, actually I'm not. So they arrested him and took him to, uh, uh, in, in, interrogated him. During the interrogation, he managed to convince them that not only was he not worshipping the devil, uh, he was doing good work. So they gave him some land in a place called, uh, now called Alto Santo. Uh, and he took his followers there and he started planting food, massive amounts of food, um, very, very immediately. Uh, around the same time, an uh, English guy had taken a rubber seed, uh, planted it in Chelsea Physic Garden, propagated it, and they started producing rubber in the colonies. Uh, very important at that time because there were wars going on, very war. Um, and so the arse fell out of the economy in the local area. People fled off the land, they were starving, there was a famine, and him and his followers were producing 40% of the food during famine because of the foresight that this guy had. So he was a, um, and they were talking about predicting the future, right? Uh, you can still get a bus to Irineo Serra, which is named in his honor. You know, this is, this is Probably one of the major reasons why our ayahuasca has come out of the jungle is because of this guy and his, his lineage. His lineage. Um, he, would, uh, he was renowned as a healer. He would uh, drink and then uh, work out. Well, I'll tell you another story, actually. He got, um, he got visited by a guy called Caetano de Lozzi, who was a, a journalist who was sent down to uh, Rio Branco because the Catholic bishops had said, what is this big black guy doing with our religion? 
uh, and drinking ayahuasca and people throwing up. You don't do that in church. So he, they went to go and uh, visit him, and um, he, when the guy get off, when Catano Veloso gets off the bus, and he says, tells him his name, he's waiting for him, tells him his name, tells him an injury he has, tells him he's just got out of prison, uh, tells him something about his father, tells him a whole bunch of stuff. And this is a traditional trope in, in shamanism, right? The shaman waiting for you when you get off the bus and telling you all about your life. About your life. And then they spent three days drinking ayahuasca. No one knows what happened then. But when he left, uh, this guy gave him uh, a bottle of ayahuasca. I said, go up to uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, no, I think it was Rio. Go up to Rio, drink this with your more sensitive friends. One of the sensitive friends he gave it to was uh, Gilberto Gil. You know, if you know the guy, he's a musician. Um, so he, Gilberto Gil, this was during the dictatorship, by the way, so a very, very repressive um, period in history. Gilberto Gil, don't, don't try this at home, but Gilberto Gil decided to drink a dose as he was getting on a plane at Rio Airport. And when he arrived in Sao Paulo, it kicked in. And he got off the plane, and there was a, uh, basically a new department of the Air Force was kind of parading around at the airport. And he was overcome with love for this oppressive, <laughs> oppressive arm of the dictatorship. Um, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. He later became the culture minister and was instrumental in making ayahuasca protected by the law as um, something approaching cultural patrimony. Uh, patrimony. So again, this guy redistributing resource to a guy who would then go and do incredible things a long time in the future. Um, guiding individuals towards harmony. So his, uh, I won't talk about him too much longer, I have to talk about this guy, I have talked about this guy for hours um, on other occasions, but um, most of his hymn book, his, his song book, is about how to live in community. Yeah, it's not so much about spirits. The spirits and that kind of stuff, it's in there, but you do that in silence, you do that quietly to yourself. Um, and, and for him, and for that lineage as well, the, if you've done the right thing by the spirits, it comes through in your behavior to other people. So another thing to think about with the psychedelics, you know, if you want people to take psychedelics, think it's a good idea, behave in a brilliant fashion. And they might, if they go, well, you're interesting, what do you do? Well, it's mushrooms. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, I want to tell you briefly about rain. So I, I lived in the Amazon uh, jungle. I lived there for about a year. After a few months, I got bitten by a sand fly. I got um, sick. I got leishmaniasis. I don't know if you know what that is. Nasty, nasty disease, flesh-eating protozoa. Um, I've got a really good scar, I don't even see it in the light, but that was my, about the size of 50p there. I like showing people my scar. Um, I was really ill for eight months, I lost 10 kilos, I lost an ex-wife, I lost rose-tinted spectacles um, on life. I emerged completely different. Um, I, um, what else happened? I had worms crawling out of it on one occasion. I was, you know, I was treating it with ayahuasca, I was treating it with, with dye meat, with local plants. Um, cleaning it four times a day with different teas, and lots and lots of magic happened. Right? And they all kind of thought I was crazy because they, in, in many ways, lost track of how powerful their traditions are. Um, but without going too deeply into that story, uh, which I have told elsewhere in other talks, you can see them online. There's one called Prejudice and Neon Colonialism in the Academic Study of Wild Horses. But anyway, out of that, I developed a great respect for the forest and wanted to do something. The forest made me ill, the forest cured me as well. And um, that's quite an interesting trend, isn't it? Uh, so I, uh, right at the end of that, um, right at the end of that period, really, about eight months of being sick and being celibate, I met a woman who uh, kind of nursed me uh, to a degree back to health towards the last. I was actually much physically better, but I was crazy by that point. Um, it was a tough, tough time. I was drinking ayahuasca every day, uh, five o'clock, uh, four o'clock in the morning, uh, for about five months. Um, anyway, uh, we went to Bolivia because my visa was massively, you know, we had to skip the country basically. Uh, and when we were in Bolivia, at one, one point, I went to the internet shop and a couple of people had said, written to me to say they dreamt about me. Uh, someone had said they just had a baby, they're very happy. Someone said this. Got pregnant, they're very happy. I emailed someone saying, if I went home and impregnated this woman, would all my problems be resolved? And I went back to the hostel, she opened the door, goes, shall we have a child? And I went, yeah. And, uh, and we did, right? So she got pregnant a couple of months after I met her. Um, I met her on January the 1st. My twins were born on February the 3rd, the following year. Um, 
and uh, born in Brazil. Anyway, so I went to go and visit her in this, uh, I went to go and be her parents, basically. She was pregnant. Uh, hello, I'm Danny. Um, her brothers took me swimming in a uh, stream in this, in uh, Chapal de Norte. And uh, it was beautiful. We had dragonflies buzzing around and fish and frogs and, you know, I was the whitest thing they'd ever seen, <laughs> nibbling away at my belly. And um, it was fantastic, very well received by them. Five years later, I went back to show off uh, the kids and uh, the stream was gone. It dried up. And all of the streams in the region are drying up. There used to be seven, uh, seven streams. There's one river left and the water level was dropping every year. This was horrifying to me. Her, her parents had kind of collected some of the fish and they had them in barrels, hoping that the water was going to come back, but it wasn't coming back because this place had been desertified uh, for a long time. Um, so I organized a, uh, a bus uh, to take locals to an agroforestry system to introduce them to a different way of doing things. And uh, that was cool. Uh, the driver of the bus was the mayor of a town called uh, Cachoeira. Cachoeira, not actually. Cachoeira means waterfall or rapids. But the waterfall had dried up in the 1920s, and it was his dream to see the waterfall flow again. So he said, we've got a school here. They, used to, they were building a nursery, a sapling nursery, but we ran out of money. Can you help? Yes. Uh, so I raised some money in England, and we built a sapling nursery there. Uh, and then uh, the next door town, which is called uh, South Sebastian de Boa Vista, uh, they also wanted one, so I raised some money there. In fact, my last English student provided money for that one. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, and then we started reforesting local springs, and these are the springs in the area. Um, so we did a few of those, and then that's South Sebastian de Borges. That's how you kind of clear out and rework a spring when it's been plugged up, because the, when you have deforestation, all the, when it rains, a lot of um, um, the silt, yeah, that's right, the silt washes off the land, plugs it up. So this is now, um, spring is working uh, somewhat better, pleased to say. But this kind of really got out of hand, expanded, that's the... Uh, Sapling nursery, um, one of them, uh, and yeah, that's the next, the next one. But then, so we got a call from a guy in Hasifi, which is really far away, about right there. Um, it's an urban centre, and they wanted a sapling nursery as well, so they built one for them as well in a geodesic dome style. And then the pandemic hit, and they uh, people were starving, so they wanted to do stuff with urban uh, agroecology. So we started doing that as well with a favela, and worked with these uh, black women to do it in the favela, producing this. Um, Basically, this woman here, she did her master's in urban agroecology, and we made these booklets, which I will I left in the chalet, but I'll see <laughs> them later. Um, and it's um, how to collect rainwater off your roof, and how to make compost, and how to do all this kind of, how to grow intensively in your little yard, and also stuff about community building. It's written for people who can't read. And that's gone down really well. Uh, it expanded from one favela, and we, we got some media from them. So this is the kind of connected network part of it. We get media from people, we put it through our networks, and that raises money. Uh, and because it's very difficult for me to help out these people on my own, what am I supposed to do? But through a network, which is uh, communicating, collecting, trading resources, that's what you can do. And the same with businesses. There are businesses that would like to do stuff that's good. If you give your money to most, a lot of charities, they don't want to diss them all, but they'll centralise your money and they'll tell you what they, they'll decide what they're going to do with it. We're not doing like that. We are connecting people, overcoming communication problems, overcoming linguistic problems, overcoming the kind of trauma which arises from hundreds of years of exploitation. These guys, one of the favelas didn't want to give us any media because they've been screwed ever since ever by people who look like me, right? So I managed to have a conversation with them and it's cool, they, they really like what we're doing. Their um, materials have now been, so that's what it looks like, um, that's kind of, yeah, irrigation system. Um, that's now been, yeah, so it expanded to nine favelas uh, and then we sent it to a Kenyan refugee camp, translated into English, uh, as Kikuma. Uh, and we've just got it translated into Arabic for work in the occupied territories as well. So how can you take an idea which arises somewhere, translate it and make it useful? You know, this is the global, local connection that we're talking about. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to skip through this bit then. Um, what happened there? <laughs> this is, I'll just, can I go over for, about, for a little bit? Can we cool with that? I'll go over for a bit, not too much. Um, this is about infochemicals. When an insect attacks a tree, the tree will produce defense chemicals, or it might produce chemicals that attract ladybirds that eat the insect. But it also tells its friend through the mycorrhizal root network, which is another type of um, 
intelligent network which has fungus in it. Um, so they all produce defense chemicals, which means when the insect gets to them, they already can't eat it. And this prevents it becoming, prevents a, a, a pest becoming a plague, uh, let's say. So uh, how do we build that into the working of a, an NGO? Well, what does an infochemical need to do? It needs to spread widely and to other species, because sometimes a one tree will inform, a fir will inform a beech, if you are a birch, or something like that, and provoke an appropriate response. So I've been seeing images of um, burn the Amazon on fire for years. I don't want to share that with my mum. Uh, it doesn't provoke the right brain chemicals in me that, uh, uh, that make me happy. So what do we do? What kind of media can we make which spreads widely and to other species? Well, this was a bit of media we made, trees and music. We got a Nokikoi indigenous Amazonian elder to sing a song, a traditional song of the rubber boom, which is a song of um, ethnic cleansing, basically, in, in, from about 100 years ago. Um, got that backed up by two London orchestras and then filmed it in this beautiful church in London and had Amazonian scenes of monkeys leaping from tree to tree. And they got Miriam Margulies to do the voiceover because she's a distant relative of mine who called me up ages ago and said, I'm a distant relative of yours, do you want to go for a curry? And I went, yeah, okay. She's a very strange woman. She likes to get in touch with very distant relatives. Um, so anyway, so other species, a lot of classical musicians that aren't really, don't really care about amphibians going extinct, but they do care about Violin bows. Violin bows are made out of penobuco wood. It is massively endangered. There's probably a few thousand of these trees still standing. You can't make violin bows out of anything else. So we just bought 50,000 of these trees. Um, and produces media which got on Classic FM and Radio 3 and all these other things. To provoke an appropriate response. The appropriate response is not to panic and shit your pants. Um, the appropriate response is to respond. To give money to the right people. To change the way that you live. And you know, if you scare people with Images of fire, you produce cortisol in their heads. And cortisol <coughs> makes us do what we've always done. Uh, if you want people to do new stuff, then to be working with dopamine and serotonin. Mm -hmm. And story and music and art and beauty does that. Uh, that is how we do our. Um, ah, yeah, I'm not the director, I'm a co director. We, how we are influenced by a network of people which inform the decisions which bring the same problems. Uh, we do school twinning, uh, programs between indigenous schools and schools in the UK. Again, that's a distributed system. We were actually doing school twinning, so now we do something more complicated, which I don't have time to explain. But it involves putting people into contact and doing projects together. Um, that's um, oh, a couple more things I want to say briefly. We've talked about that. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the psilocybin in the brain research, where uh, you knock out the you knock out the psilocybin affects the receptors in areas of your brain which uh, bring information together and integrate it. And what happens when you take it is different receptors in the brain start communicating outside of these centralized, uh, centralized systems. So for example, synesthesia, when you hear, you see a sound, for example, is because part of your brain is going, it's a sound, part of your brain is going, there's something purple coming out of the speaker. <laughs> when you're tripping, obviously. Um, <laughs> And there isn't the integrating systems going, no, it's not a sight, don't see it, hear it. Um, more? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what did that say? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Robin Carhart Harris, right? He gave an example about um, what would it mean if you were to blow up a capital city? I'm not saying do this. Um, regions which don't normally communicate, communicate more. So he's talking about the regions of the brain communicating. Um, I would like to indulge myself for another eight minutes of your time. In particular, I'm looking at Eric here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, I'd, I'd like to just kind of, all right, I'd like to just uh, change pace. What's the name of the, oh, the goddess is called? Keridwen. Keridwen. Okay. I'm going to change pace a little bit now. So I'd like you just to... Make yourself comfortable, in fact, maybe put your feet on the ground. I'm, uh, I didn't tell you, I'm also a hypnotist. Um, so hypnosis is a useful way of engaging with your mind. Uh, I can't hypnotize anybody, um, but what I can do is I can give you instructions, feed you um, certain instructions. If you want to follow them, you can follow them and you'll find your mind going in a really interesting direction. If I say something you don't like, you don't have to follow it, you can ignore it, you can change it to whatever you like. So if you want to join me and listen to some words and see where we go, then let's do it. And if you don't, just don't make a noise. 
Um, right then, people. So I'd like you all to just be nice and comfortable. That's really good. And uh, if you're happy and ready to be hypnotized, just give me a nod. To go into trance. Really good. You don't have to go into a deep trance. But what I would like you to do is just imagine now tensing your fist. You don't have to do it, but imagine tensing your fist. So tense that it couldn't possibly get any tighter. And if you can imagine that, just nod your head for me. Good. And I want you to imagine the opposite now, which is to relax your hand. So totally relaxed that it just couldn't get any more relaxed. And if you can do that, just nod your head for me. Good. You can let the camera go there, mate. It's all right. Um, so uh, that's the level of relaxation we want to get. And we want to get that level of relaxation on the eyelids. The eyelids are the smallest muscles in the body, right? And so in a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, well, I think most of you have your eyes closed already, but you can close your eyes and just relax those eyelids. Relax them totally and completely, so totally and completely that if you gave them a little test to see that they, to, uh, to try and open them, you'll see that they won't open, right? And of course, they're your eyes. You can open them whenever you like, and you do that every day. But I don't want you to do that. I want you to stay in control for your relaxation. And then... Give them a test to see that they're so relaxed that they just won't open. And you go ahead, give them a little test. All right, that's really good. You might find your eye, great, you stop testing them now. Really good, you're doing brilliantly. So just take that relaxation on the eyelids and take it up over the top of the head. And then send a massive wave of relaxation down through the head, through the body, out to the feet. And let it all go, discharging. Really good, you're doing brilliantly. And just notice how it feels. And if you need to wiggle around, you can wiggle around. If you need to move your position, when we're asleep, we wiggle around and we don't wake up. You don't need to come out of this state. So you're doing really well. What we're going to do is we're just going to deepen that relaxation. So what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to count three. On three, you're going to pop the eyes open. And then I'm going to count three, two, one. On one, you're going to close the eyes and you're going to go twice as deep. So one, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down, twice as deep. Relaxing and letting go, relaxing and letting go. Noticing how comfortable it feels to relax. We're going to do that a few more times. Each time going twice as deep. So one, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down. All the way down. And the deeper you go, the better you feel. And the better you feel, the deeper you go. Got a few moments to ourselves here. We're going to go and explore the forest in a moment. But let's go a little bit deeper. One, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down. Deeper and deeper, relaxing and letting go. And my voice goes with you. I'll do that one more time. This time, just go just as deep as you feel comfortable in this moment. One, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down. All the way down. Feeling your way into your body. Hearing the sound of the water outside. And remembering what an amazing and beautiful place we're in. Let's just retrace our steps that brought us here to Kaimabod. And you will have noticed, as you're walking around, some incredible trees. And I want you just to imagine yourself walking around now outside. And I want you to feel that sponginess of the floor beneath you, the ground beneath you. This is a very special type of spongy ground. I want you to see those rocks around you as well. And see the greens. If there are colours, make them sharper, make them more colourful. If you hear any noises around you, they're not going to disturb you. They're just triggers for you to relax deeper and deeper with every breath. You're doing really well. I want you to feel, I wonder if you can feel the humidity on your skin, the feel of the cool air. And I wonder if you can make that image, if it's 2D, make it 3D, make it surround you, walking through the forest. Beautiful forest living forest and you can feel beneath the ground all of these all of this life all of the decay and all the potential you can feel all these connections these mycorrhizal connections beneath the ground as well and all of the ancestors and all the seeds of the future as well and let's come to a an oak tree a really large beautiful oak tree and just in your mind's, in your mind's eye, with your mind's eye, put your hand out and just touch the bark of that oak tree. Feel the roughness of it and run your hand around the oak tree as you go around it. That's great. And you notice 
Now, it's one of those oak trees which is hollowed out, hollowed out just the, just the size of you. And you can sit down in it like a throne. And it's comfortable in there, and it's your imagination, so it's got whatever you like in it. You can put whatever you like in it. Make it however you want. So sit down in that oak tree, and then notice what it feels like, and then bring yourself down. Bring yourself down through into the roots, and notice how those roots divide, and divide again, and divide again until they become connected to the mycelial threads beneath the ground. And let's go now into that mycorrhizal root network. And I'm going with you. Spread yourself out through that network that covers the whole forest. And it's been around for as long as the ancient forest is part of Wales are around. Send yourself down. You're doing really well. And you can feel the moisture of the earth. You can feel the potential in all the connections down there. And in that moment, I'm going to share an incantation with you that I shared with Eric when I came down here on a completely different mission and brought me here today. Incantation to the, to the mycelial networks. And as I'm doing that, I'd like you just to consider where you would like to make connections in your life. Perhaps there's people or communities that you want to connect with. Perhaps there's spirits you want to connect with or ancestors you want to connect with. Perhaps there are people who you want to disconnect from because those my senior are clever and when the nutrition is gone they will retreat and they'll go and find something else to do. And perhaps there are connections you want to maintain but change. These things can all change. So let's go down and as I'm, as I'm repeating this incantation, I'll do it three times. Feel those connections opening up or closing down or changing however you want. Mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others, we touch with our tendrils, entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies, in pleasure and pain, twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots in forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor, love in the heart as it boils in its fervor, love in the stories we tell to each other. Love in the dendrites that dance as they measure mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others we touch with our tendrils, entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies, in pleasure and pain, twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots in forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor, love in the heart as it boils in its fervor, love in the stories we tell to each other. Love in the dendrites that dance as they measure mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others. We touch with our tendrils, entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies, in pleasure and pain. Twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots in forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor. Love in the heart as it boils in its fervor. Love in the stories we tell to each other. Love in the dendrites that dance as they measure. Just taking a moment to feel that new configuration, to feel all those potentials, to feel all the compost of the old that can feed those networks. And as we draw ourselves back to ourselves, towards the roots of the tree and to the divided bits of the roots, I want you to bring back whatever you've discovered in there and leave behind whatever you want to leave in there and bring it back. We are here to connect, we're here to network, we're here to think, we're here to dream futures, we're here to make connections and imagine, use our imagination to go wherever we want to go. So let's bring ourselves back now into that beautiful oak tree and just in your mind's eye, standing up, walking back across the ground. And as you walk, I'm going to count to three and on three you're going to pop the eyes open, feeling really good, feeling ready to connect, ready to talk and probably ready to eat lunch. So one, feeling the blood moving around your body, and two, it's like splashing cold water in on your face, it's like splashing cold water from that stream outside, and it's freezing cold in your face, and three, you can pop your eyes open, and come back to the room, and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>